loyal sons and daughters. We're celebrating the St. Bernard. How's it going, everybody? How's my party, people? It's the happy hour show. Let's do this. Okay. What do we got? Oh, I don't know. This guy, he he, he played in the MLB All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. And he's got a World Series ring. I don't have either of those. Guessing most of you don't either. Or, uh, you know. But, and he went to St. Bernard. That's right. You know, I'm celebrating the 80s because I graduated in 82 from St. Bernard High School in Playa del Rey, not far from LAX, and then got into coaching and got to coach up there. That's where I met Royce in the baseball program. The rest of the time, I was watching the greatest television show ever, Magnum P.I. Mm-hmm. That's right. All right. Let's start this thing. I'm a Venice, California-born, Los Angeles-based sports fan, one that has played, coached, announced, and promoted sports my whole life. My love affair with sports started in my own backyard and has led me to this podcast. Thanks to the support of the Amateur Athletic Union in East Bay, I'm excited to bring you Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon aims to bring its subscribers interesting, unique, and uplifting stories. You can find us at sportsstoriespodcast.com. We drop audio and video podcasts every Thursday and go live on YouTube Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Many guests have shared their stories with host Denny Lennon, such as Super Bowl and BCS champions Brendan Ion Badejo, Peter Bulware, and Trevor Lawrence, three-time Olympic gold medalist Karch Karai, Kentucky Derby winner Doug O'Neill, NCAA champions Toby Bailey and Sinjin Smith, Hall of Famers Jimmy Lennon Jr., Rudy Tomjanovich, World Champions Boom Boom Mancini and Tim Leary, AAU Sullivan Award winners Catherine Plummer, Sabrina Ionescu, and Spencer Lee, not to mention the head honcho, AAU President Dr. Roger Gowdy. We've also had best-selling authors Wesley King and Wayne Coffey, and our sports stories favorite Norm Bass, the first African-American to play two professional sports post-World War II. Become a friend of the show on Patreon, and you can help keep the dream alive. Go to patreon.com forward slash Denny Lennon or go to our website to see all of our social media links. If you have an interesting, unique, or uplifting story to tell, contact us on sportsstoriespodcast.com. Coming to you live from Los Angeles, we're in the shadow of LAX. It's a top-rated video podcast in the Sentinella Adobe Corridor. It's where we share a wall with the Korean United Methodist, and you can see St. Jerome Church from our back porch. We're in the 7428 studio where Jimbo and Marley run the show, and Buck kicks back until he's got to kick it out. It's SSDL Live at 5 on YouTube. All right, we're live at five. We're on YouTube. If you'd like to enjoy the show and chat along, you can do so. I think you got to be uh, subscribed to YouTube and uh, have a channel. Easy to do. You can manufacture that quicker than not. And uh, come on in. Okay, um, my family. I hope you're here, family. All right, how about my St. Mark people? I know my St. Bernard people are coming strong. I know they are. They want to say hello to Royce. How about my VBC and my AAU people? All right, we're off and running. Uh, top five states outside of California. Interestingly enough, these seem to be some of the stops on Royce's tour. That would be five, Missouri, four, Texas, three, Massachusetts. That's where he took home a ring. Arizona's number two, always holding on to the number one spot outside of California. OH. Hi, O. Jimbo is at the controls today, producing. Back. She's back. She's back in the driver's seat. Hey, Lakers are on at six. That's right. Those guys, that's their 17th banner, just hanging, waiting for them to grab it. Apparently, they are playing some team from Denver. I was not aware they played professional basketball in Denver. That's great. Good for them. <laughs> Apparently, chicken is a big thing there. They're called the Nuggets, and they were once kicked out of the Amateur Basketball Association. No, the O. Oh, the ABA, American Basketball Association. Okay, well, hopefully they'll do their best. Hey, before we keep going... Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, has died and want to recognize her great service to our country um, and RBG RIP. Okay, um, you will notice we will not have Carlos on yet again. Apparently, they continue to shoot that uh, documentary on Stone Cold Steve Austin out of there. But we'll be going there to do a big interview on October 1st. 
I think around the five o'clock hour with Sam Lagana. He's the voice of the LA Rams in stadium uh, in uh, SoFi, Sophie, Sophia Loren Stadium is what I call it, Sophie. But that stadium is going to be pumping because Sam Lagana is there. He's also the chairperson of the Wooden Award in addition to many other hats that he wears. And I'm looking forward to interviewing him October 1st. Come on by and visit us. Hey, it's happy hour. Woo-hoo-hoo. Dodgers are in first place. Lager's going to grab their banner. Chargers, Rams still undefeated. Okay, as mentioned, we got uh, Royce Clayton on the show. We also got Jake Downey. Let's get after it. Let's see what we got. Let's go to our, um, our court reveal. Oh. This was good. Last Friday, I uh, put our contractor on blast because he left us looking like this for like weeks. And we were like, hey, we got Jerry West, the logo of the NBA, coming to do an interview, right? Like, we need, he's got to have to shoot. He's going to have to take the shot, like the East Bay shot. So that's what, that's what. We were in disrepair, out of sorts, our, our aging dog. But then we finished it up. The 7428 court reveal. Bam. Okay, look at that. After this. We're waiting for you. We're waiting for you, logo. Right there. That's right. That's right. He signed, he signed, it, signed it the last time, time we talked. It's coming. It's coming. Hey, hey. join, join us, on us on Patreon. Yep. Okay, you can join us on Patreon, and you can see those first initial shots. Uh, Christine took a shot. Marley took a shot, and I took a shot. I wonder who made the first shot on the court. Anyways, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to give that away because it's on Patreon, so you can go get it there. Hey, um, let's look at a uh, recap of this past week. Uh, on Tuesdays, we always do Never Seen L.A., Jonas Never. That's Never, 1959. He is something else. I think he's got another one. So it's Never Seen L.A. And we talked about Touch of Venice based on the movie Touch of Evil. It's a spectacular one. I try to give historical and social context to his works around Los Angeles. Uh, Jonas will be a guest uh, coming up in October. And we hope to bag as many of these as we can prior to that on Wednesday. Um, oh, there it is. Let's see. That one's spectacular. I think he did that one around 2011 Wednesday. How did you get such Olympians. a large number? I mean, and, you know, um, with we had on million. Pete Davidson from Captain U. Uh, that's a that's a platform for recruiting for young athletes. Can use that. Uh, they they had a strong presence. You know what else we had on? We had two lawyers, um, two lawyers that talk college football, that talk college sports, two NCAA attorneys, sports. NCAA sports. Um, so they're not showing on here, but we'll come back to them Oops. eventually. Hmm. That's interesting. We got to pause here. All right. And Thursday we dropped our video podcast. That is Chris Geeter McGee, the Lakers studio host. You recognize him from that. Look at this. Boom. He won the first ever East Bay shootout where we compared all of the guests that took the shot, their shots against one another. And uh, he did it. So the backyard's looking a lot better, obviously. Um, and there it is. Geeter. Hey, and here we are. It's happy hour. We got Royce and we got big game Jake Downey, our baseball expert, who's going to weigh in. Okay. Um, one other thing we got going is uh, we always have Twitter polls going. And um, the one I have up right now compares the two greatest beach volleyball players ever in the men's division. That would be Sinjin Smith and Karch Karai. And we want to best out of seven series to see who's the king of the beach. And we are comparing everything, but they're playing for now. So uh, Sinjin won, has won two. Karch has won one. Sinjin uh, took the better sponsor with uh, his side out brand and also a better senior season at UCLA. Karch won for acting. He killed it in the Baywatch episode over Sinjin's Magnum PI episode. And uh, right now, Karch is leading 64%, um, I think, the 36% in the poll that we have asking who had a better high school team their senior year. Okay. At Sports Stories DL, go there. Hey, also on Sports Stories DL, you know, we come out with clips after the show so you get to know our guests a little bit better. We came right out after our Preps to Olympians show with the two attorneys that talk, and we dropped in this one. And basically, I just want to timestamp it. This is last Wednesday, and we had our boys on there, okay? And Aaron said, hey, 
It's coming. I wouldn't count the Pac-12 out yet. That's right. Remember, when the Pac-12 comes back to playing football, who broke the story? Okay, Dan Patrick, <laughs> take it easy. Take a step back. We broke that story. DP, you know, I tried to mimic him. He's starting to steal our stuff. All right, let's keep moving. We're doing great here. Um, I think we got all the way up to big game Jake Downey. I'm fired up for our guest tonight, man. Royce was such a baller. Uh, back in high school days, it was so clear to see he was going to be a pro. And then he went on to have this career that I was able to follow. You know, one time you even saw him um, on the field at Dodger Stadium. We'll talk about that. All right, big game. Jake Downey's coming. But when we bring somebody on that comes on a lot, we'd like to have a montage. Turn me on. Hey, football season is over soon. The finals go next weekend. We'll be getting rid of the pigskin and moving on to basketball. The ball sure bounces a lot easier. Hi, I'm Jake Downey, reporting for Cox High School Sports On Demand. Hey, it's game time. Redondo Union and Peninsula. You can hear the noise. It's going to be a full house here tonight. It's a Bay League opener, and Redondo Union, the team in red, is one of the best teams in Southern California. Hi, I'm Jake Downey reporting. Hi, and welcome to Fontana, where sports fans around the world the last couple of years have come to know this place for the glistening new racetrack, the California Speedway. Hey, Brent, it's a strange business. College football coaches, grown men, making their living, convincing 17-year-old boys to come to their school. Their whole livelihood consists of how they do on this day. Hi, I'm Jake Downey reporting. Hi, I'm Jake Downey. In Long Beach, I'm Jake Downey reporting. And you know what? That's sports. I'm Jake Downey for Daybreak OC. You have yourselves a great Monday. Ah, that's our guy. Give the kid his ball back, Jake. Let's bring him in. Big game, Jake. How are you, JD? Oh, sorry. Uh, that's my bad. Christine's that's taking... call, your expert editor? <laughs> yes, it is. He's, he's the best, isn't he? Uh, he knows where the bodies are buried. And, uh, geez, that was at least one chin and 20 years ago. Well, you know, look, give the kid a ball back. You know, he's in layup lines, coach, and let's get some work in. And this guy's on the court, you know, stealing the basketball, Jake. I, I You know what? None of that was staged. The ball just kind of rolled into my stand-up, and I, I happened to have the wherewithal to grab it, and I wasn't giving it back until I had made my point. <laughs> no, you weren't. Yes, that was obvious. Poor kid. Hey, um, Jake, I know uh, when I told you who's on the show, you immediately jumped at the uh, opportunity to talk a little Royce Clayton. Uh, you are uh, the guy who beats everybody else in the bar with baseball trivia and knowledge. And uh, tell me what your initial thoughts when you when you hear about uh, Royce Clayton coming out of great old St. Bernard High School in Playa del Rey. Well, I knew of him, and I knew him uh, kind of coming onto the, the big league scene. And he was already a veteran big leaguer when he was with the Cardinals and was kind of uh, the guy who was tasked with replacing Ozzie Smith. And uh, you saw that uh, in that montage of me at Dodger Stadium. Yeah, I was actually sent from uh, Santa Maria, San Luis Obispo down to L.A. to do a story with Ozzy Smith in his last year with the Cardinals, in his last year in the big leagues. Uh, and Ozzy was not satisfied with the way he was being shown the door by the Cardinals. Yeah. Hey, Jake, actually, we got that. Let's, like, let's take a, a quick look at this. Uh, I think uh, that's that's not the one. That's me getting recognized at Dodger that's Stadium. The one you wanted. No, that's not the one. There's oh. there's the other Jake video we have. Oh, you've got the piece about. Yeah, we got that. Uh, uh, yep. Oh, that one. Okay, here it comes. Level more than anything. Players don't usually leave their teams on their terms. Even star players seem to leave a year too early rather than a year too late. Ozzy hasn't left the cards yet, but he finds himself sharing time at shortstop. It wasn't that Ozzy Smith was opposed to playing one out of every three games. It was the way it was handled. When he speaks of handling, he means by new Cardinals manager Tony LaRussa, who installed Royce Clayton as the primary shortstop over Smith, a future Hall of Famer and a civic treasure in St. Louis. Well, that takes me back in time. And I tell you, Denny, um, baseball and all sports are that inherent push-pull between the young guys coming up and the guys already there and the guys at the end of their career trying to hang on. And, you know, you kind of blend it into uh, a team and, and hope you make it work. 
Uh, you know, Ozzy was clearly at the end of his career, and sometimes uh, when it's winding to an end, it's uh, it's not fun, it's not pleasant, and he thought he was uh, due uh, more respect and uh, maybe a longer glide path to the end of his career than the Cardinals were willing to give him. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Royce, even though he was an established big leaguer by then, was kind of put in the position of being the other guy, which you know wasn't fair to him. And, and at the same time, that's sports. Jake, uh, that's that's professional sports. Would that have been the same year that Royce was uh, named to the All Star team? Because I think that was when he was with St. Louis '97. He was an All Star, and I'm wondering if that's probably the same year. Uh, when I went to talk to Ozzy, that was '96, and I'm pretty oh, okay. sure '96 was Ozzy's last year. Um, okay, so '97. He was the reason he was a local story for us in San Luis Obispo is that he it was. A, a player in college at Cal Poly SLO. So he was, he was uh, okay. local for us, uh, even though he grew up in LA. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, you can probably find examples of that kind of story. I think of uh, Pete Rose getting replaced by Ray Knight and Ray Knight struggling with replacing Pete Rose. And sure. th there are uh, other examples of that through baseball where, uh, you know, a young guy comes on and replaces an old guy and struggles with being the new guy. And he may be a phenomenal player. And Ray Knight went on to greater success with the Mets uh, later mm -hmm. in his career, but uh, definitely uh, uh, struggled. I, having said that, I don't know how much Royce uh, struggled with coming in for Ozzy because, again, he was already an established big leaguer and clearly right. could play the game and uh, proved himself by having a long and prosperous career. Um, so, you know, maybe the media attention was more on Ozzy feeling disrespected than this new guy coming in. It probably helped that Royce wasn't a rookie when he right. was stepping he, he in. Been in four or five years, yeah. Right, and and so he was an established big leaguer. So maybe that changes the the equation a little bit. But um, yeah, it, it was it was hard to talk to Ozzy at that time, knowing what a great career he had. Even though you know, being a Dodger fan, he was a Dodger killer at eighty five. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing uh, that he was headed for the Hall of Fame and and perhaps the greatest fielder at any position ever i you know that that's maybe an argument over a drink with you and i and, and other baseball nerds but um to see him going out the door that way uh clearly dissatisfied was distressing who um who came in uh behind what youngster came in behind you in santa maria and, and kicked you out of your seat Jake? <laughs> oh you know what that's a good story and uh, uh, scott reese went on to sports center and and scott reese is now the voice of stanford football and basketball so yeah, I no. was replaced by greatness. Okay, yes, apparently, yes, yeah. Well, we haven't replaced you yet here, so you still got a home, Jake. Uh, be patient. Yes, <laughs> I'll screw uh, it up somehow. Yes. Um, so we we have some fun stuff to go over. I thought you might want to hang around a little bit while we bring Rice in, and even if I do kick you off the show, make sure you hang around because I'd like to get your uh, your analysis at the end. It's always expert. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I, hopefully, you have time for the three of us together because uh, yeah, we would except for the Royce. Yep. Yeah, hang, hang on. Let's. Uh, hey, we're gonna bring him on. He, he he's uh, M M B M L B um, All Star. He's a World Series champion. But you know, most importantly, he was the man at St. Bernard High School. Hey, we always bring somebody on with the montage. Let's do that. It's time to bring him on. If I'm not mistaken, we're going to shoot up the coast to Malibu, and we're going to see the head coach of Oaks Christian High School's baseball team, the MLB, -er, the all-star of the World Series champ, and he is Royce Clayton. Hello, Royce. Hey, Danny. How's it going, buddy? That bring back any memories? 
Oh man, a lot of memories real quick, uh, a lot of different uniforms, but uh, yeah, it's just, just surprising to uh, look back and see how quickly it went. But I was warned by so many veteran players to say, hey kid, it's not, it's just gonna fly by and it surely has, but I, I, I have to kick myself and, and remember that I did play because now everybody walk everywhere I walk around, people just call me coach. So <laughs> yeah, right. Your, your coach or, or your kid's dad, you know. That's that. That's that, that, that you wear it though. You wear it. It, it, it with pride, of course. How'd you like us uh, digging deep and finding your senior photo there? You like that? Yeah, I was like, man, I, I don't know if I would have drafted that kid. He was a little thin <laughs> and a rough on the edges, but. You know, it was, it was a good time to come out when I did because, like I said, I, I think I was like 170 pounds wet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's bring back in Jake Downey. He's my baseball expert, Royce. So if there's anything I forget, he remembers. And um, I think he actually had an opportunity to interview you for a prep show. Is it, Jake? Uh, you know what? Um, in addition to that piece that I did with Ozzy where I got a shot of you, Royce, in the dugout, uh, you and I met at the – uh, an Oaks Christian football game a couple years ago with Otis Rushing, uh, who was uh, one of my yeah. boys' uh, youth coaches. Yeah, and, absolutely. And we, we talked about a, a, a professional baseball league that I've been working on, uh, the GBL here on my shirt. Oh, okay. Uh, the Global Baseball all. League. But I, I know you meet a million people. But anyways, it's a pleasure to be on the show with you. No, it's a pleasure. Pleasure's mine. How's that league coming? It's needed. Uh, uh, still pushing it up the hill. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this little uh, COVID-19 virus, <laughs> yeah. but that seems to be getting in the way of uh, just about everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we kicked the can down the road, but uh, we're still trying. Good. Yeah. You know, um, Jake did that piece, uh, Royce, and uh, we're going to eventually get a, a chance to get back into your St. Bernard days and then move forward. But I would imagine there was a lot of pressure that you had to feel having to replace Ozzy Smith, even though clearly – you know, you were an established pro by this time and, and were the guy for the spot. Yeah, it was a real uh, strange time for my life, uh, personally, not just my career, because um, anybody that grew up with me know I was a tremendous Ozzy Smith fan as well as I'm sure uh, most most shortstops, aspiring shortstops at that time were. Uh, but I was over the top. My mom worked for TWA. At that time, it was the only way that you could get anything because they were stationed in St. Louis. Mm. So the, their hub was in St. Louis. So I would I was able to get memorabilia from uh, Ozzy. Oh, uh, right. him, uh, I mimicked everything he did. I had videotapes. So it really uh, set the, 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 the ground level for my career as far as a shortstop. So um, when I was traded over to, to St. Louis, it was it was surprising to me, for one. Uh, for two, uh, my question is, well, what's going to happen with Ozzy? <laughs> yeah. You know, they, I knew he the wizard was over there, and you know he's taking care of me as a kid coming up through San Francisco. Uh, but my my conversations with Tony were just reassuring that they brought me over there to play, and um, you know they expected me to come in and fill that position. Uh, but obviously, Ozzy had other plans when I got there. He didn't he didn't want to retire. He didn't retire, and uh, it became a pretty big controversy that was like an opinion poll every single day. Um, I'm probably one of the very few players uh, that was booed at home every time yeah. I came to the dugout. Um, but at the same time, I always look back at that um, situation, and it was a personal growth process for me. It made me very resilient. It, it brought me to the point where I felt I could handle any situation. Uh, and the biggest thing I talk about that season is that it was my first playoff experience, hmm. and – you know, that team was up three games to one against the Braves. So mm. it's just, it just really brought me to a point of unselfishness because everybody wanted to talk about Ozzy. I was a little disappointed that, you know, it was about Ozzy and he, he didn't have a problem making it about himself. Uh, but from that point on, I know I'm kind of skipping around, but from that point on, from a personal standpoint, I, I wanted this, uh, I made a pact to myself to put team first. Uh, always try to help a young player, uh, and that helped me stay in the game as long as I did. I, I, uh, th that's kind of why I brought on Jake. Jake, I wanted you to apologize for whipping up all that sentiment against Royce. That wasn't cool. And <laughs> maybe you wanted to Believe say, me, every, nobody was on my side. It was like I was just a byproduct of the punching bag. <laughs> you know, I have to say, Royce, and, and it, it's interesting to hear you say, 
Wait. Oh wait! Oh, oh don't! I, <laughs> I did. Sorry, Rex. We have this thing oh, on the show where, where we okay, throw people off the show, and I try to get them to like start talking, but I, we didn't mean to. Go oh, ahead, Jake. Okay. Sorry about that way. Um, it, it's interesting to hear you say that that you got booed at home, and that it, you know you you. It seems like you had some tough skin from having been in the big leagues and uh, having already established yourself, so that you kind of knew that the, it wasn't personal, that you were, you were just kind of the other guy and it really didn't have as much to do with you as it did with Ozzy, even though it's got to be hard to uh, get that kind of noise in your own home park. Um, but uh, I see what you mean about personal growth. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, is, it is a shame that, you know, players don't get to pick when they leave the game. Um, <laughs> and so uh, to see a great player like Ozzy uh, struggle with that, uh, is is tough, but it's also tough on the people around you. And I don't know, did he have any words of wisdom for you? Were you close when you were with the Cardinals, uh, or did he look at you as the other guy? No, that was that was the disappointing part. I don't want to get too too far into it, um, but that was the disappointing part for me because, like, I the only thing I I look back and and say about the situation uh, from a baseball standpoint is I watched him prepare every single day, so. You know, I said, if I do these types of things, I can have that same type of longevity in my career. But as far as anything that he had supportive to talk to me about, pull me aside, you know, that, that came from my other teammates, Willie McGee, uh, mm. Gary Gaetti. Uh, you know, I had a lot of guys pulling for him in my corner, which was important for me because everybody else seemed to be against me. Um, but the other part you said is not personal. I will say this, after the season, we lost game seven in Atlanta. My father went to go see my grandmother. And my dad and I are very close, and it seemed as if, you know, every every game, every pitch, every situation, he was going through it with me personally. And uh, he went to go see my grandmother and unfortunately had a stroke. Ooh. So I think that culmination of what I was going through personally and, you know, what he felt, it just hit ahead. and. You know, after that, it became personal to me because I told the, the, the Cardinals, like, look, I got another year before I'm a free agent, but there's no way I'm coming back to St. Louis. And um, I played out the half of the next the following year and was traded to uh, Texas. But uh, from, a, from that point, as a player, you can take things personally. Um, for me, I, I did. I'm not saying it was the, there's no wrong or right decision. It's just my decision that I made. And it, it – it, Sometimes things in sports become personal. That one time is, is one of those situations where it was something personal where I wasn't coming back to St. Louis. Jake, uh, I noticed that your dogs are bothering you. Uh, you know, there it is. See that? That's how we get rid of people, Royce. <laughs> Wouldn't do that to you. You're our lead guest. I do that to our sub, our, our bench guests. That's what we do. <laughs> um, uh, Royce, I want to throw back to um, to your St. Bernard days. Uh, now, I know, I think, uh, you, you know, you, you grew up in the area. You, I think you're born in Burbank. You grew up in the area. But one of the things I found interesting, I think when you're a kid, were you around Harvard Park a lot with uh, the days of, like, um, Daryl Strawberry and, and Eric Davis and so forth? Yeah, so so I grew up in Inglewood. I was just born in Burbank, but I grew up in Inglewood. And her, I got wind, like, my junior year in high school that, you know, most of my favorite players that came from L.A. were all working out at a, a park in, in South Central called Harvard Park. So uh, me being the kid I was, such a baseball uh, just fanatic, I went down there, started watching those guys, eventually went out in the outfield, started picking up baseballs, uh, shagging for them. And one day Eric Davis invited me to go, go ahead and hit. It was almost dark. But um, you know, they were, they were kind of impressed and said, hey, if you keep coming out every day, we'll make sure you get ground balls, take ground balls. And, man, Barry Larkin, Bick Roberts, Chris Brown, all these great players were out there. So I was just in, in, in a, you know, in a dream almost. And um, that paid my professional career as well. Cause I was able to see how these guys prepared um, really have the types of conversations uh, that were necessary for me to understand what was, what I needed to do to make myself a, a prospect, uh, give myself the best chance to be a big leaguer. And uh, the program is what we call it. And the program was, you know, the foundation for me being the uh, not just the type of player I was, but, you know, just understand the community and uh, what it meant to be a, a African-American player uh, coming from L.A. at that time. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was interesting time because I graduated from St. Bernard in 82 and there was always such a good, you know, mix at the school. 
that represented mm -hmm. like Los Angeles a lot more than some schools did that were that were you know much more segregated or or positioned just around their community. And um, St. Bernard, you know, when I was going there, pumping in basketball. And not bad in, in baseball and okay in football, but just killing it in basketball. But during the time when you were there, I mean, we had others like um, there, I'd come back to coach a little bit. So I was coaching the JV while you were on varsity. But I mean, Pat Ahern yeah. and Danny Melendez and was it Tim Williams or Tim Williams was uh, Tim Williams, yeah, Tim Williams, Frank James, Mike yeah. Parks, yeah. Uh, we won. You know, we went to Dodger Stadium my junior year. Should have won it. Yeah, uh, but we would win league consecutively. Uh, so we set the foundation for, um, you know, greatness when, like you said, St. Bernard's was known as a basketball school. Yeah, so, it was. Um, that's, uh, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You know, I, I got up there to coach football, and this guy had, had retired <laughs> from the LAPD, and I saw yeah. him recently on the OJ um, thing, and so I quick, quick took that shot. But anyways, mm -hmm. I got some shots of other people in here. Now, I think that's Pat Ahern. Pitching yeah. uh, in, in in the league, and he he was quite a player coming out. So I, I meant to shout out Bob Yarnell there. He was a lot of fun. And then Dan yeah. Melendez, he was another uh, big hitter. And one of the things I always found interesting at um, St. Bernard was that was that left field fence, right? Yeah. And you got a yeah. chance, obviously, to play for the Boston Red Sox, where you dealt with the Green Monster in left yeah. field. And that must have been some flashbacks from from St. Bernard days. I think I rolled a little video of that too. Go ahead. Uh, what, how about the play in, uh, at at uh, St. Bernard's with that left field fence? You know, it was it was a good experience. It, it really shaped my swing because, you know, I realized that it was going to be very rare that any pitchers were going to come inside. It was everything was away because everybody was uh, worried about that short porch and left field. So, you know, I developed the swing because I knew that pitchers were pitching me away, where I would just shoot for center field gap and shoot to the right right center. Yeah, and basically had to block myself the, of that wall on that on that short porch, um, which, you know, <laughs> for the type of swing I had. But, um, you know, we got a lot of grief about it, especially other teams that will come in and say, oh, we're going to hit a bunch of home runs. But, you know, again, on the defensive side of the baseball, I told my pitchers just throw them away. And, and I had put out after pull out. <laughs> yeah, you did. They would, over. <clears throat> they would just roll over the baseball. And, you know, I was there to support it. And, you know, really, you know, with uh, Bob House, the way he, he worked on the infield, we had a great infield. Yeah. So I uh, had Mark Holcomb over at third base. And yeah. you know, really the foundation of how we won championships because that, that fence had a lot to do with it. Yeah, it, it did. Um, so roll with either one of the videos. I want to show you some stuff that's going on. So I was over at St. Bernard, and, and look at this, Royce. They're redoing the football field, which was long right. overdue, right? They're putting in this, um, this, this beautiful new field. And look at that scoreboard out there. Uh, and, and so I think I also have some pictures from back in uh, the old days, Royce, when, when I played there. Um, oh, wait. I just want to show you how hardcore I was at St. Bernard's, Royce. Yeah. Um, just want to know who you're dealing with. That's me on screen right, uh, velour shirt. And I'm, fl <laughs> I'm flipping off the camera like a hard, like, you know, I came, I came strong, Royce. I came strong. I see that. I see yeah, that. you know, that's what you do in high school, like a like a stupid freshman. But um, I think we got a football shot here, which it used to look like. So no, anyway. So then I went over to the baseball field, and obviously they're letting the grass grow in the off season here. But there's that left field fence, kind of that famous left field fence out there. Um, yeah. And that's some. See, there it is. That's just digging yeah. in, getting some journalism. There it was. And then this is the new scoreboard on the football field which is spectacular, nice. right? Look at that. I don't know if you've been by there recently, but I figured you'd trip out on it. And uh, so that's the old scoreboard back in the day. Yeah. So this one should be a little bit better. That's That guy came strong back in 82, you could tell. Right? <laughs> he went by Dennis back then, he, all business, no Denny in those days. And this is me probably throwing up, I don't know, just a clip inside of a 1,000, you could tell, <laughs> probably from my legs that I could probably do, you know, 12 – 50 if I needed to. There's my right. boy Marcelo. Yeah. So there you go, Rice. Little trip down memory lane. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, awesome. So so um, it's 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 great that the school you know continues not only to function but that they're they're making those capital improvements. Yeah, that's great. You know, um, I was extremely honored when they were tired my my jersey. Yep. Uh, I think they followed up with uh, Tim Williams. So uh, there's a couple of guys. You know. Uh, that are well deserving, like you said, Pat Ahern, Dan Melendez, but you know, it's just you know that tradition that that we started with the baseball program 
St. Bernard's in the community, not just in Play Del Rey, but right. throughout LA had this great tradition of, you know, academics, um, athletics, excellence. And um, I'm, I, I know that, uh, you know, they've had some, some rough years previous, you know, uh, some years back, but it's good to see things are starting to come back and always supported the school. And, um, you know, St. Burns is needed in, in, in the community for sure. Um, Rush, not only did, uh, you know, you ha have a, um, this, this, this baseball career going on, but you know, you, you're depicted in movies, Royce. I mean, <laughs> like well, you, you, you were played by somebody in a movie and then you played somebody in a movie. And right. so I'm interested in this, uh, which one are we going to show first? What, we what, have one. Oh, we only have one. So let's see. Uh, let's see you being depicted in the movie, um, The Rookie. Morris, you're in. Rice, I want to break this down. All right. Worse. It was the absolute worse. What's up with Jorge? It's Jorge Sanchez that played you in the movie. That did not look like your swing. You know, and that was that that I was asked if I wanted to be in the movie. It was during Disney approached me, didn't tell me a whole lot about it. I had totally forgot about who they were talking about, to be honest okay. with you. I didn't know. I was like, who are you talking about? What who is that guy? All right. Uh, we had no no uh, scout report on him. Uh, when I asked about him, in, in segue before that, you know, I, I had a home run that night, so I was just oh. like, this, this, "Oh, that hurts." I never tell that part. No, it's okay. <laughs> but, uh, no, they don't. But uh, yeah, so you know, Rudy, our hitting coach, is just like, "Hey, he's probably just a thummer," you know. But he th he threw the ball firm. There's no doubt about that. But at, at, like you said, that, that that the guy they played, it's like you could have yeah, done. Yeah. The uni was all horrible. Just everything about that was just terrible. I'm with you. Terrible. I'm with you. I would petition. I would petition MLB to take that strikeout away. That isn't. That isn't right. Right. So, so when you talked about um, 
having a situation where I played Miggy, mm-hmm. um, El Tejada, and Moneyball. Yeah. Right, in Moneyball, right? I had a conversation with him and told him, you know, just, hey, you know, what was going on? And I said, here's the deal. I was played by somebody that I forgot his name, and I would never do you the disservice that that guy <laughs> did me. So you're, you're, you're safe with me, Miggy. I'm going to make you look good. <laughs> you know, you bobbled a double play ball that was tailor made. I even made you look good doing it. <laughs> Ah, that's hilarious. Uh, at least, at least Jonah Hill didn't play him because Jonah Hill played Paul De, De Podesta in the movie. And Paul De, De Podesta is like, "I'm out, man. That dude's like 120 pounds heavier than me." This isn't right. This is this is what happens when you yeah. get played in the movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. You got no choice. But at least I took care of my man Miggy, so he was happy. <laughs> you got to love that. You got. And how did you 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 figured out a way to speak a few lines in Spanish good enough to get the job? You know, it's funny because I, I was originally approached to to help be a baseball coordinator, and uh, Fish, who who does a lot of these videos and movies, got to know him extremely well. He's a great guy. Uh, said that this 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 role was open for a shortstop, and they're kind of having a tough time filling it. And uh, you know, he said this is a distant for it. If it if it works, it works, and you can figure out what you want to do. So sure enough, I get the part, and. I'm rehearsing all this, all my dialect in Spanish. I come to the set and speak Spanish. The guys were hilarious, just laughing. <laughs> it was part of my gig. So I'm getting all in character because I'm watching all these other great actors. So it only comes to the day where I have my scene. And um, it was in my accent. I, I walk by David Justice, who's Stephen Bishop. And I go, hey, man, that's a dollar, man. <laughs> <laughs> So Bennett comes, cut, 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 and he looks at me, and he goes, lose the accent. Just drop it. Just lose the accent. That was amazing. <laughs> I love it. I would, have, yeah. I would have had to fall back on my Spanish one from St. Bernard, uh, Voila Oficina, something along those lines. That would be the best I could have brought with. Man, and I was I was disappointed because I've been in character for all this time, and then you just hand me after one try. I was like, give me another try. <laughs> I don't see you tell. I don't see you say anything to Brad or you know. You know these guys get take after take. I get one try. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. Brad Pitt gets his own trailer. I'm sitting on the room. Yeah, that's not right. Uh, yeah, we had fun though. It was a great time. Yeah, that it was. A I'll time. bet you learned something uh, doing that. Um, so uh, before we get to uh, your gig now as the uh, head coach out at Oaks Christian, ask you a few questions about playing because you, you you got an opportunity to play in a lot of different places um, in the major leagues. First question is, like, what was that? You, I think you played in maybe 10 places in, in your 16-year career or 17-year career, but what's it like moving each and every time? Or did you keep one central location? Or, like, what did you do with your stuff? You know, it really wasn't that bad. When I was single, you know, I just made – I bought a home when I was with the Giants in uh, Scottsdale because we had spring training in Scottsdale. Yeah. So my okay. first home in Arizona. It's an interesting story because Tim, Tim Salmon lived directly behind me. Oh. Luis Gonzalez ended up moving down the street. So it became like this baseball. Yeah. Tom Candiotti lived across the street. Okay. Uh, in like this cool little softball neighborhood if we ever put the family <laughs> team. Yeah, uh, I, was say. I would always come back because I'm such a golf head and Arizona was – my brother was out there. My mom and dad spent a lot of time out there with me. So I would just – that was my home in the off season, regardless of where I played. So it wasn't okay. until I played in Texas that I actually bought a place uh, where I actually played. I had a condo there, mm. uh, got married and, and, you know, had the triplets. And so that condo became uh, out of the equation and, you know, the rest. Yeah. Of the but as far as, um, you know, the way my, my career panned out, which I think is, you know, part of the collusion that baseball went through is that once we hit 30, uh, you're just on year to year deals, regardless of the types of years you had, you were just, everybody's presented uh, the same one year deal, the same type of, uh, of pay. Mm. So, you know, it was this kind of pointless to even think about just settling down anywhere besides coming back, playing your, playing your six months, coming back home and then okay. you know, going through the free agent process again. But, you know, this is part of the game and part of the evolution of how things change. But, um, you know, like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't redo anything about my career. Um, San Francisco, you're you're the first you're the first round uh, pick, right? And did that mm-hmm. come with some expectations? I mean, you're so young. You're what, eighteen years old or something? Yeah. You're the first pick. Eyeballs are on you as soon as you show up. 
was that that's a lot for a kid that age. Yeah, but like I said, the blessings of you know my life was the fact that I had so many great mentors. Mm. And, you know, the guys I worked out with before I even had a chance to get drafted uh, just told me about you know, hey, you, even Eric Dar- Eric Davis, Daryl Strawberry, Daryl told me a lot about him being the first pick overall in the, in in the country. And his thing is, man, you gotta stay hungry. Yeah. You put all that aside, no matter what happens, uh, you put put all that aside and you work your tail off and you get the respect. So I, I just played like that every single day. You know, I felt like I had to earn something. And so it, 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 it again, paved the way for my career, the latter stages, because um, my 17 years, I was a starting shortstop on opening day, all 17 years. So I always approached um, spring training as if, you know, I had to earn my spot and, you know, just panned out that, you know, those last four or five years, that was the case. And it was nothing new to me. So if you if you set the tone when I coach my kids, I said if that's in your DNA just to go about it hard, go about it the right way, and just go out there and try to get better every day, it becomes your DNA. And everything else that surrounds you, or every everything else that's supposed to be a factor, becomes a non-factor. One of the um, uh, nights that I remember, uh, Royce, uh, I, we'd known each other, you know, when I was JV coach or whatever. And then you're playing for the Giants. I think this picture there is probably like '92. 92, mm-hmm. 93, and you'll see uh, you'll see my my face is on that big board out behind you. So it's pretty much Denny Lennon night at Dodger Stadium, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. um, so uh, there I was, and as I was walking off, all of a sudden I hear, "Hey, coach!" and I, and I look over, and he's and he's like, "What happened to your haircut?" Because I used to wear my hair like on a flat top or whatever. And then I got such credibility that the starting shortstop for the Giants was calling me out from the dugout. I got to thank you for that. Um, right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah. Uh, playing for the, I know when you play for the Milwaukee Brewers, I was always like such a big Bob Euchre fan because he's just a gas. That guy, he's so funny. Was he? He was probably still in the booth calling the games and so forth. Oh yeah, yeah. Euchre's yeah. a great guy. You know, just as uh, charismatic as you as you see him on the movies and hilarious you know, commercials and <laughs> you know just, just just a heart and you know uh, the face of basically Milwaukee baseball. Yeah, uh, he's an icon in the area and. You know, it, it just been like I said, blessed to be in so many great places, and uh, Yuke is one of those special guys that you're you're able to get around and hear all his great stories, and you know he's always got a good one to keep you loose. And <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he, he's, he's an icon, just like we had out here with like Chick Kern or whatever. Oh and, yeah, so, yeah. He, 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 he's, he's hard to like say being Scully, but you know, in, in in Milwaukee, he's that guy. He's that guy. How about Washington Nationals? Were you aware, like, if I'm not mistaken, they they were originally the Montreal Expos, right? Right. And and so how long had they been the Washington Nationals when you got there? Uh, I think that was in uh, maybe the second season or it wow. may have been the inaugural season. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Wild. So uh, what was special about that is I was always close to Frank Robinson, his family. Um, uh, Barbara sold me my house in here in Malibu. And uh, we just always been close. And I would go to games with, with uh, Michelle, Frank and, from Barbara and then to play for Frank and uh, have him as my manager was just a blessing and learned a lot. Even at that stage of my career, I think, you know, after 2006, I played one more year, but um, just to, to be a part of that history with Frank Robinson, uh, one of the very few, obviously uh, MVPs in both leagues, uh, one of the first African-American managers. So I played for both Dusty Baker and Frank Robinson, which is, you know, when you look back at it, it's like, man, not too many players can say that. And, um, you know, to this day, you know, I just can't believe he's gone. But it's just it, like I said, it's just so many things have been, become blessings in my career, my life, uh, just playing this beautiful game. What a tremendous uh, story that is too! you having that opportunity to play for those groundbreaking black Americans. And uh, now you are in this mentor position where you get to work with young people, of, of course, of all colors, but that are coming up through the game. Um, I mean, I mean, that's really got to make you feel like you're carrying on an important tradition. Yeah, and it was tough for me because I, I knew I always wanted to, you know, pass the torches like, you, like you're saying, Denny, and it's very important for me to find a way to do that, not just to my own kids, but the extension of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought about pro ball, but obviously I wanted to be with the kids uh, here and here while I had the opportunity. I, I retired at a great time to see my kids grow up. Uh, but uh, – debating, getting some offers and helping out a little bit here and there in spring training. 
uh, I got offered this opportunity in high school baseball that, you know, really changed my perspective and really says, told me that this is what, what my true calling was as far as, you know, passing the torch. So uh, working with young kids, uh, helping them, you know, learn the game of baseball, teach them how to become young men using baseball as a tool. Uh, Denny, you know how many kids, you, 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 you know, young men's lives you touched uh, as a coach. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's just as gratifying, if not more gratifying, than, uh, you know, my own personal playing career. So um, coaching at Oaks Christian is uh, a, a blessing. Uh, both my boys are in the program now. Uh, Liza just entered high school, so Liza's a freshman, Royce is a junior. And uh, just to be, like I said, touching young men's lives is an honor. Wow, that that that, that is it's something else. And it's it, it, the honor is the right word. It's an honor to you get this opportunity to have an impact on a young person's life. And, and we know how it works in athletics because they're all in, right? Like when, when you're coaching an athletic team, they're all in. And so you really do have their full undivided attention. And that's that's rare uh, for young men or women, you know, to be in a position where they're giving it, they're all to something. Um, I know one of the challenges for being, you know, I just, um, I just was an athletic director for a few years and have stepped in, into this world, but um, one of the challenges for any of my coaches that I were hi was hiring was keeping the parents at bay. Like in effect, a let having the parents understand that their role is being a parent and, and not to guide um, some career that may or may not be what's in their mind. And I think it's really important for somebody like yourself to be able to uh, help young people through that process because they don't want to go against their parents' wishes. So the parents have to navigate this place of being supportive, but not getting too involved. Yeah, that's the toughest thing about it. And, you know, that was my fight my first two years uh, coming into the program. And it's not as bad because they once you start to develop the culture, the culture manifests itself through the players. But, uh, Danny, I, I was really surprised and the question, like, where do these guys come from? You know, because we were raised in a generation where our parents were hardworking. Uh, could, if they came to the games, it was great. But uh, their their main objective was to get us through the school for educational purposes. Whatever we did, we did. Um, if there was a problem with the coach, you know, then you had a problem with the coach. It wasn't anything the parent was going to get involved with. Right. So I'm trying to understand where these helicopter parents uh, came to the table, which is, to me, it does a disservice to the development of the young person uh, because – you know, through my through the program and what we do, we're trying to teach them accountability. We're trying to teach them from going from boys to young men, um, get out of the selfish state of mind, be a good teammate, be accountable. And it seems like there shouldn't be a fight with the parents about what this means. And the big thing for me where I have a problem is that there's moments and things that happen uh, in various kids careers when they're playing high school ball, Denny, I'm sure you can reflect on it. And you see a kid making a turn as far as showing some maturity in their very proud moments. And then that parent comes in and says, well, you didn't, you didn't start or you're not the starter. So who cares? And you know, there's some very uh, things that don't really go in full with what we're taught and brought up right. uh, in, our, in our time. So, it's, 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 it's hard to understand, but we're, we're done, we've done a better job of articulating what the, uh, the program at Oaks Christian is about and what my, co my coaching philosophy is about. It's not about, you know, this kid becoming a big leaguer or, you know, going on to play college baseball or whatever. It's about him becoming a, a good young man, a right. good father, a good son, a good brother, a good si you know, sibling. Uh, all these types of things that really matter. And, um, you know, everything else takes care of itself. And, and you can look at your program with those types of young men, and you know you're going to have a su successful program. And everybody around it involved with it is going to have success as well. Exactly. And, 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 and we're, you know, we're just fortunate that for the most part, we got good coaches like yourself who really are interested in the person and then the athlete. Uh, you know, coming coming behind that. Um, you know, you, you talked about Dusty Baker uh, being one of your managers and, you know, somebody you, you probably looked up to. Imagine if his parents got too involved and got in his head, he would have never invented the high five. 
<laughs> right? Like he did with the yeah. Dodgers, him and Jimmy Wynn. They invented the high five. And that would have right. never happened if his parents were doing all the talking and stuff. No. You know, there's so many things that wouldn't happen if parents were involved and it's just stuff that, <laughs> no, you know, let, let kids be kids, you know? And, yeah. I, and the big thing, I, you know, it's easy for me to, to cut that off as a coach when, uh, you know, I get in the car with my kids. The last thing I want to do is talk about the game. Yeah. <laughs> and so, therefore, I'm not going to talk to them about whatever happened in the game. That's over and done with. Uh, it's time for me to be dad. And, you know, what do you want to go eat? You know, and, yeah, and this right. is the <laughs> yeah. most important thing. And, 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 you know, parents come to me for advice and say, what can I do to help uh, my son get to, you know, play college baseball and uh, get to the big leagues or whatever. And the truth of the matter is just go sit and be a fan and stay out the way and let them do what they need to do and then be a, be a mom and a dad to them. That's what they need. That's what they need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to, um, you know, kind of revisit this conversation um, Royce, you know, the, the Wednesday show we do has a little bit, a little bit different of an audience in that it's more, um, high school athletes and parents of those, and then directors and coaches that kind of watch that one that's on Wednesdays college. and it would be great all the way up through college. And, and so it'd be great if you, if you, you know, if you have time to kind of come on, I'd love to continue this type of conversation, uh, for somebody, yeah. especially like yourself, that's, you know, involved <clears throat> as, as a head uh, baseball coach at a, at a, at a strong program out here in, in the Southern California area, but also somebody who's been through all of these different levels and all of these different challenges. Yeah. And the biggest thing is I'm, I'm going through it with them because I'm a parent. Mm -hmm. Obviously I want my kids to achieve whatever goals they have, but you know, um, one of the biggest things that uh, I heard uh, in my readings and findings of, of coaching styles and, and basically life itself is that um, you know, you got to welcome the struggle. And yeah. You gotta allow your kids to struggle. Yeah. <clears throat> so many of so many of the parents are trying to you know avoid the struggle for their kids, which is taking away their true uh, process of how their life is supposed to play out and how they're supposed to develop. So whenever they're struggling, it's like, okay, well, I'm happy that you're struggling because you're gonna become better from dealing with it correctly. And uh, you know that's that's a, that's the way we go about it. Absolutely. Um, Brilliant. That's great. I, I would love to continue like this conversation yeah. on, on that show you where it's a little more specific towards, you know, that that group. And um, I think it's been fun going down memory lane a little bit here. Yeah. Um, I know some St. Bernard people are going to view this. They're viewing this tonight and are going to view it on the backside uh, when, when it sits there. And they're going to take pride in Royce Clayton, MLB <laughs> All-Star, baby. And where do you keep your um, World Series ring? You know, I was fortunate that during the fires, um, I lost my home in Malibu. Mm. Uh, so I just put it in a safe deposit box, which I don't know even to this day why I did it. And, uh, you know, because normally it was sitting on my mantle and, you know, I put it on maybe the four or five times. But uh, it may have been like three months before the fires and I just put it up and was fortunate enough to have it put up. When I had um, Tim Leary on the show, he uh, showed off his ring. Nice. And then I had a uh, boom, boom Mancini show off his world championship boxing belt. Oh, that's and, awesome. And you know what I showed them, Royce? Oh, boy. My 1986 Venice Backyard Championship volleyball trophy. First place. Greatest team ever. <laughs> Me and my cousin, Tony. Right. Tony, that's right. Shout out. Greatest VBC team ever. It's pretty solid, huh, Royce? That's, that's very solid. <laughs> Very like, solid. I'm gonna clip that and just keep that. <laughs> I got I got Royce validating my uh, backyard championship. Hey Royce, uh, su super appreciate you, you coming on, uh, making the time, and and, and also uh, always am appreciative of people like yourself that are moving young people forward. No, I appreciate it, and thanks for what you've done, and uh, you know my my history with St. Burns and you guys like yourself. Or I'll still call you coach. You I like I mean? that. That's all right. right. Oh, I wish that probably. Uh, kids are calling me coach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's nice, especially when when they have like triplets and then grandkids, and then they'll go, "Hey, coach." <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right on. All right. Thank What's you, up? Royce. All right. Take care. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's bring back in Jake Downey real quick because I got a question for him. Is he still here? Uh, he is still here. Jake, you hung on. Um, Jake, first question for you: uh, Did you answer about the dogs? Because, or did you see that one coming? I figured you'd have something for me about the dogs. Uh, yeah. w since I was on your show last, uh, we have moved from uh, yep. North Hollywood yep. to to Northridge. So we have a little bit more space for the dogs, uh, secondarily Good. for the kids. 
And uh, the, right. dog, the dogs uh, are uh, capable of disappointing me from greater proximity. Very good. Now, um, next, put um, Royce's career in, in some kind of context. I, I, you know, he was always a top-notch fielder, but, he, you know, he also slugged at, le at least 10 homers a year. Uh, I think he scored, I don't know, what, f uh, maybe 500 runs, 700 runs, something like that. Yeah, you know, uh, statistically, he's kind of in that uh, middle range of hitting shortstops. And a guy who, you know, if you play 17 years in the big leagues, uh, you were doing something right. And, you know, clearly he had good mentors from his mom and dad to, uh, you know, the, the veteran players that he played with as he was coming up. Because it seems that at every turn he respected the game. He took it seriously. He prepared well. And it wasn't like he was coasting by being with a team forever. Uh, yeah. he, was, he was constantly singing for his supper or – Mm -hmm. playing for that next one year contract and you, you know you look at his stats and the teams he was with and that's a great adventure to go experience a new city and a new fan base and play with new players but there's also pressure in needing to impress enough to be able to get a contract at least somewhere the next year yeah and and he was capable of doing that into his 30s which is not something that everybody does and remember now as the average fastball rises and the uh, average career uh, shrinks among position players because as you get into your 30s, you can't get around on those 98-mile-an-hour heaters that you're seeing from the fifth inning on. Right. Um, it, it's just a different game. So uh, okay. to answer your question, uh, Royce Clayton was a good-hitting shortstop who was also a slick fielder, as the position requires, yep. and, and is in that group of good – to great big leaguers, uh, you know, a couple clicks below the, the legends, but still a guy who had uh, a, a an impressive career. I'm gonna I'm gonna forward the fact that the fact what that I hit him fungo grounders from the backstop, and he could grab it anywhere between second and third base as part of what moved him from average to good. Yeah, that, that's range. Well, yeah. you know, they always say that when a guy gets drafted, everybody on a big league club was the high school quarterback and the guy yeah, who hit sure. fourth and was the pitcher and uh, it was hitting 500 in high school. And you just forget that as the best player from every neighborhood progresses through the system, you get to the big leagues and you just have 25 studs, just freak athletes who they'll yeah. go out and play golf and they'll shoot scratch golf. Yeah. And it's not even their main game. So, uh, you no know, to, to just get to the big leagues is an accomplishment. And for someone like, like Royce, to have lasted as long as he did is it's, 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 a, it's impressive. a monumental ch uh, achievement. Fact check me, um, Dusty Baker, Jimmy Wynn invent the high five with the Dodgers, 1974? Uh, I, I give you half credit on that. It was Dusty Baker and Glenn Burke. Ooh, thank you. Glenn Burke w uh, became uh, famous as uh, uh, the first man uh, to pass away of AIDS uh, yeah, for, right. from that scourge in the yeah. 80s. And... Uh, is identified yeah. as uh, one of the first uh, openly gay. He wasn't not when he was playing, but but an yeah. openly gay player later. Uh, but a, a tragic figure. There, there's a documentary out there about Glenn Burke that uh, is pretty interesting, and okay. I'll see if I can send it to you if you want to share it with your audience. Yeah, um, good. Okay, uh, I'm glad that Dusty Baker was part of that. And I always loved me some Jimmy Wynn growing up. He was my guy. And, uh, and I, I was at that game as a kid in seventy. Come on. I was. I was in the left field bleachers what? about 20 feet from where Baker's home run landed. And that, so they high five. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that, that's the recorded first high five. Up until then, you know what? You slap five with, with your guy if they did something good. But if they did something particularly good, I went, I went with 10. I'd slap 10. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that was my thing. And, and remember, that was Dusty's home run that gave four Dodgers 30 home runs. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, um, Jake, question. Uh, better to be played in a movie or to play somebody else in a movie? You know, if you're played in a movie, it means you've uh, achieved a certain amount of, uh, of status, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, although for someone who uh, maybe is uh, looking for a gig and a payday, maybe it's kind of cool to – play someone in a movie uh okay. you've had you've had randy rosenblum on this show and yeah and randy and right. i have been we've been pitching a movie around hollywood about uh his uh uncle slapsy maxi rosenblum and come strong I, i've seen the trailer that trailer comes right at you 
Well, my my <laughs> proposal is that I play Bud Ferrillo, who asks uh, a oh. couple of uh, uh, piercing questions of Muhammad Ali yeah. at, at a press conference uh, in L.A. Uh, in advance of the Ali Liston fight at the sports arena. Oh, the now uh, LAFC soccer stadium. What was then? Uh, that's where that, that's where that is now. It was then the attached component to the LA uh, Memorial Coliseum. Well, and it gained greater fame as the place where I worked at the Oshman's ski sale in 1984. Oshman's. <laughs> and where and where uh, Bruce Springsteen almost <laughs> took it all the way down. Well done, Jakester. All right. Well, let's not hang around too. Oh, look at this. We're gonna leave. Look at this. See, he comes right out of the gate. That's strong. <laughs> this is a Slapsy Maxi trailer. He comes right nice. out of the gate. He goes Hitler. And we're, well, whoa, okay. And then you get into it, and he's saying all these people have yeah. some kind of connection through the Slapsy Maxi. And, and I'm, I'm with it. I think I like this uh, potential um, documentary. I mean, Slapsy Maxi was a figure of quite renown that kind of got lost because, you know, it was prior to the time when everything would be recorded and remembered on some internet site. Well, even you remember the movie Airplane where they had a lot of sight gags, including yep. uh, great Jewish sports heroes, and it was a really thin book. And I was trying to explain that joke to my dad, and my dad said, "Hey, Slapsy Maxie Rosenblum, fantastic yeah. boxer." <laughs> there it is. Uh, That's the guy. He is the guy. All right, there it is. Um, Jake, sir, thank you for coming on. Um, I won't. We won't. We, we for sure won't we'll swipe you again. So go ahead and say the name of your dogs. Man, how do you fall for that, Jake? Come on. <laughs> right Come now. on, Jake. <laughs> the other guys that knew it was coming, they're like, "Oh, okay." All right. Um, hey, that that didn't suck at all, man. Royce Clayton, thank you for being on the show. That was terrific. Jake, always. Jake's got uh, so much sports information on all kinds of sports, but baseball, it's crazy. He knows any and everything about baseball. All right. Lakers are on. We got to get to that. Um, Magnum P.I. on, uh, I don't know where you can find it, but I'll bet you go to that website, Just Watch. Look up your Magnum P.I. You'll be happy. All right. Jonathan Quayle Higgins my guy all right um uh higgy baby yeah. let's do some box cobbler kick it out and we out hello there there yeah i'm a talking hot dog and i'm here to say come watch sports stories with denny lennon comes on at five it's on youtube so if you have to muster up some time <laughs> comes on at five if you miss any episodes catch up relish these times. Thanks for watching and listening. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is produced by me, Marley Rice, and Christine Jinbo, and edited by bad boy Bobby McCall. Original music courtesy of Lennon Music Production, and original images courtesy of Sienna Lennon Photography. A big thank you to all of our contributors of the show. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is a production of Sports Stories, Inc. and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, or wherever you watch and listen. Make sure you press that subscribe button, give us a review, leave a comment. It will really help us grow the show. And you know what else will help us grow the show? Head on over to patreon.com slash Denny Lennon to get some never-before-seen videos, pictures, interviews, and so much more. We are all over social media and constantly sending out clips on Facebook, conducting fun polls on Twitter, going live on Instagram, and more. To find all of our social media links, head on over to sportsstoriespodcast.com. SSDL proudly supports the My Stuff Bags Foundation and the Heroes Movement. Links to how you can support and help these foundations can be found on our website. We also want to give a big thank you to all of our partners of the show. So, as Coach Lennon would say, any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email me, Marley, at info at sportsstoriespodcast.com. We want to thank all of our followers and listeners, and we will see you next time. Check it out, book! <laughs>